Hello everyone and welcome. After 10 years, the rotary engine is back and it's coming in the Mazda MX-30 REV. Now, there's a lot that's really cool about this engine and there's some clever tricks that Mazda has employed. There's also some disappointing news that goes along with it. Now, I have plenty of videos explaining how rotary engines work, so let's compare this new engine versus Mazda's last rotary engine which they produced, which was used in the RX-8. So I'll put the specifications up on the screen and as you can see some of the disappointing news right off the bat this is a significantly lower revving lower power it is just a single rotor rotary engine rather than the dual rotors on the RX-8 uh, so you know this isn't quite the same thing that we used to get with this super high revving uh, really neat unique engine experience now we have something a bit different now one of the most notable changes of this engine is that you are now directly injecting fuel into the combustion chamber rather than in the intake port like was done previously. So Mazda says there's two real benefits to this. First of all, the location of where you're injecting that fuel keeps the fuel in the main area of that combustion chamber and also you have better atomization because you're using higher pressure and a finer mist of fuel being injected which is helpful at low temperatures such as startup. Now there's a pretty fascinating quote in the press kit about this. So they say when fuel is injected into the port on a conventional rotary engine. A lot of the air fuel mixture ends up at the back of the combustion chamber, not fully combusting and eventually being expelled as unburned gas. This has a negative effect on both fuel economy and engine output. So Mazda is saying directly in their press kit that a lot of the fuel in the conventional rotary engines just goes out the exhaust. I think that's pretty incredible to see in a press kit because let's go back to 2008 and see what Mazda said about the rotary engine. Through the incredible efficiencies of a rotary power plant, the Renesis engine delivers smooth, linear power on a grand scale. So you can see they play with words a little differently there. The new engine is also now using exhaust gas recirculation, which Mazda says helps with efficiency at low loads and low RPMs because it helps contain some of the heat within this engine. So Mazda engines inherently have a lot of heat loss uh, because of so much surface area within this rotor housing. And so they say using EGR, they can help reduce some of that heat loss. We're now using aluminum side housings versus iron. Mazda says this is good for 15 kilograms of weight savings. And they're also using a spray-on plasma uh, ceramic coating that they're applying to those housing sides uh, for better wear and better friction. They also now have wider apex seals up to 2.5 millimeters, a 25% increase, which they say gives better wear resistance. Okay, and the big kicker and the kind of disappointing news here of this new engine being introduced is that it's simply used as a range extender. So the engine spins up a generator, that generator provides power to go to a battery or to an inverter, which then powers an electric motor, which is powering the vehicle. So there's no direct link between the engine and the driven wheels. So if the rotary engine is just being used to power a generator, what's the point of using a rotary engine at all? Well, Mazda says the big advantage here is that the engine is compact. So if you compare the 0.83 liter making 74 horsepower versus BMW's inline two cylinder used in the i3 as a range extender, that's just using 34 horsepower with a 0.65 liter. So, you know, fairly similar in displacement yet wildly different power numbers. And a big reason for that, of course, being that a rotary engine for each rotor has three active combustion chambers which are all happening simultaneously. But there's also a big problem with rotary engines and yet Mazda has come up with a very clever solution. So here we have our classic internal combustion engine using a piston and cylinder. And there's a technology called variable valve timing that is very common in today's engines which are using piston cylinders. So how does this all work? Well basically what you need to know is this intake valve which opens and closes in order for you to pull in that fresh air to use with combustion. If you close it too early, well you don't let enough air within the cylinder, right? And then if you leave it open for a really long time, well then you let some of that airflow go back into the intake and eventually that piston starts moving up and pushing more of that air out, effectively reducing your compression ratio. So if you open it too short, you have problems. If you leave the intake valve open too long, you have problems. There's some ideal that falls somewhere in between. 
and it's dependent on the airflow coming in. And that airflow coming in changes depending on your RPM. So as this engine is operating at different speeds, when you want to open and close this intake valve varies. Okay, so that's no problem. With internal combustion engines using piston cylinder vices, we have variable valve timing and we can change it throughout that RPM range. So, can you do that with a rotary? Well, not exactly, right? Because we have this simple port, and that port, whenever it's exposed to the intake chamber here, within our combustion chamber, that's when you can pull air in. And then once that rotor covers up that valve, well, then you can't pull in any more air, right? You don't really have control over when this is open. So you do have control over how you design this overall engine, and you can optimize it for one specific RPM, but you can't optimize it throughout the whole range, unlike what you can do with piston cylinder engines. So I found a study looking at rotary engines, and they talked about, you know, what is ideal? And so at low RPM, much like with an internal combustion engine using piston cylinder, you want to have that intake valve close early. You want less time to have the maximum amount of air come in to the cylinder. As you get to higher RPM, you want more time. You want to be able to let that air to pack its way in for more time as your engine's going really fast. So there's this variance in how much time you want these intake valve open for optimum volumetric efficiency, meaning putting as much air as you possibly can within that cylinder. And the same is true for rotary engines. That's what this study showed. Uh, as you have that RPM go higher, you want to leave the amount of time that that intake air has to enter the chamber a bit longer so you can get more air in it. Well, how do you do this with a rotary engine if the timing is fixed because that whole opening is a fixed location? Well, a Mazda patent from December of 2022 answers this question. So first, let's understand the vehicle layout based on this patent, which is very similar to how it is actually laid out in the MX-30. So we have a battery pack. That battery pack sends energy to an inverter. The inverter sends the energy to a motor. The motor rotates a gearbox. That gearbox ultimately rotates your driven wheels. In this case, it is front wheel drive. So you also have a rotary engine, which powers a generator, and that generator can be used to either send power to that motor powering the wheels, or it can be used to send power to recharge your battery pack. Great. Now, one of the options Mazda describes in this patent is that they add an additional electric motor that's going to be directly linked to the eccentric shaft of your rotary engine in order to manipulate the speed of your rotor's rotation. So why would you want to do this? Well, again, remember, for low RPM, we want less time for our intake to be open. For high RPM, we want more time for our intake open so we can get more air into the engine. So, Here's a little chart that shows the logic of how this electric motor is going to work. Basically, the way we're going to set up the engine is so that at the RPM that we use the most, and keep in mind, as a generator, there's going to be like one set nice efficient RPM where this thing's cranking out a good amount of power. So we're going to pick that uh, RPM where we're efficiently generating power that we think the engine will sit at the most frequently and that's going to be our zero assist spot, meaning this motor is doing absolutely nothing to aid the rotation of this rotor. But if we're at a lower RPM, then we're going to help speed up that rotation and if we're at a higher RPM, we're going to slow down that rotation for a portion of it. So. If we look at our intake stroke here for the rotary engine, this little Dorito here is going to rotate uh, and that's going to cause our eccentric shaft to rotate 270 degrees. Well, throughout that rotation, that's the total amount of degrees of rotation that we have for our intake stroke. So for the initial bit, we're not going to do anything. We're not influencing in any way. But right at the end, we're going to use our electric motor to change the speed of that rotation. And that speed change is the dependent on where our RPM is. So again, if our RPM is really low, then we're going to add a positive assist of torque. That motor is going to help speed up the rotation so that you have less time for intake. And then if you're at a really high RPM, meaning this speed right here is really fast, well then you slow down that rotor very briefly at the end of its intake stroke in order to give it more time for air to come in. And then you turn that assist off again and it maintains its rotation at a higher RPM, but it slows it down just for that little bit at the end so you can get more air within the engine. 
Now, you might reasonably say, wow, that's complicated. We've got an extra motor and an extra inverter. We're adding this complicated mass to this already complicated powertrain. And also, is the efficiency gain of rotating that rotor just a little bit faster for these different portions actually worth the added energy to power this motor? And so, is there a way that we can eliminate this motor and this inverter? Yes, yes you can. Okay, option two as described by the patent. And this is extremely clever because instead of using this additional motor and inverter, we're gonna simply use the generator to do that job. Now, one of the key differences here, previously, we designed an engine such that the most frequently used RPM gave us our maximum intake charge air efficiency. So the overall design of the engine is designed for one specific RPM, and at that specific RPM, we have our maximum intake charge efficiency, and and thus we don't need to use any assist from the motor. Now our most efficient RPM for intake charge efficiency is the highest RPM we're going to use. So in other words, like the engine's red line, the highest RPM we ever will use uh, is going to be our maximum intake charge efficiency. And then anything less than that, we're going to have to provide some positive torque in order to speed up the rotation of the rotor in order to shorten the duration of that intake. Again, we want the longest duration for our highest RPM. So that is the location where we provide no assist. And so how do you provide a torque boost with a generator that you're using to generate electricity? Well, basically what you're doing is you're using this generator like a brake. When it's generating electricity, this generator acts like a brake. It's providing a torque that this engine has to overcome. For a brief moment, you can basically shut that off. You can reduce the torque requested. There's an electricity generation torque and you're reducing that request by a certain amount. So in other words, it's like, for example, if you were to be driving a manual transmission, have your foot on the gas uh, and you're in, let's say, sixth gear, and then you push in the clutch. You take off that load from the engine and so the RPM just flies up. You're doing the same thing here. You're generating a bunch of electricity, then you're saying, hey, reduce the amount of generation. And suddenly there's nothing resisting this engine from spinning up really fast, so it increases its rotation, thus shortening the duration of time that your intake is open. Super clever. So that is what you're doing as you're using lower RPM. And if you were to be at the maximum RPM, then you're simply not requiring that generator uh, to change its load at all. Okay, so as a quick review, there's a certain duration of time that is ideal in order to maximize the amount of air we get into this engine and thus maximize power and efficiency. And so we can influence how much time this rotor has for its intake stroke by using a generator and taking that generator to change the amount of load it is placing on the engine and thus how fast that engine rotates. And so by doing this, we're, you know, it's a very simple solution. We're eliminating that extra motor and inverter, and we're not powering an extra motor, right? And so the only thing you might wonder is, well, aren't we gonna have some weird vibrations by changing this RPM constantly as the thing is going along? Well, your engine isn't actually connected to the wheels, so you don't really care that much. You can isolate the vibration of this engine because it's not going to the driven wheels, and thus you're not feeling that pass along you know, through your drivetrain to you. Instead, it's maintained within this rotor and its generator, right? So it's just simply sending power to the battery pack, and it doesn't necessarily mean that all these crazy vibrations are going to be passing to you. So it's a really neat solution. I don't know if it's actually used within the MX-30 or not, but this patent just came out conveniently when the MX-30 REV is coming out, and so it seems likely that this is something that Mazda has been thinking about with this vehicle. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.